the grand final, Warhead Junction, our first map in the best of three series between the Exodia stack and Team Ash. And I know, I know, some of you are looking at this right now, it's like, what did you say? Best of three, grand final, ha? Huh? Caldo, are you high? Nah, 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 nah. So we have two qualifiers every week. We have a Wednesday qualifier and we have a Saturday qualifier. And we decided at some point that we would run best of three grand finals for the Wednesday qualifier. The reason is pretty simple. We have teams from multiple time zones here. For some of them, the tournament runs really, really late and people have worked the next day. So uh, with that, we just decided that it makes more sense to have the weekday qualifier being a best of three so this is why this is a little bit of a shorter one the saturday qualifiers are obviously still best of five so if you watched all of that you're already aware of it but we are here at murky cup qualifier number five so after this there's only one qualifier left the teams have to step it up they're also still going for bounties as we've seen before exodia stack has completed a probius bounty today and they completed the nidus bounty with zagara so team ash obviously could also try and lock something in here where Junction is our first map. In case you're not really familiar with the bounty system, I mean, at this point you really should. This is qualifier number five after all. But just to go over it real quickly, we have $2,000 of prize money for this tournament, all sponsored by I Can't Wait, Absolute Champ, who is supporting the competitive scene here in Heroes of the Storm. Blizzard has long abandoned everything. And thanks to people like him, we can still run tournaments like this. So we are splitting the prize pool that we get uh, through that into $1,000 for the top teams and $1,000 for the bounty pool. Bounties, um, as you see on screen now, essentially handicaps that you can give yourself. You're supposed to win a game with... Uh, it's a little bit like the daily quest or the, the quest that you have in the game where um, you have to win a game with Butcher. You have to win a game with Gazzle or whatever it may be. And if you do, you get a ticket for the bounty pool. And then at the end of the tournament, we're looking at how many tickets you completed, how many bounties you completed and we uh, measure that against how many were completed in total. And then you get a share of that bounty pool of those thousand dollars according to that. So it's a bit of a risk reward incentive for the players. They don't have to do this. They can simply ignore that and say like, we don't care. We just go for the tournament money for the actual prize money. But teams that feel like, hey, we can build a comp around certain heroes on that list or certain objectives that you have to fulfill there can do that. Now, again, as I said before, you can uh, complete one bounty per map and each team has their own bounty board. We have teams that have already completed five, six, seven of those and at some point it gets a little bit thinner. I think the one bounty that nobody has completed yet and nobody has even attempted to do is Twin Blades variant. That might be too much to ask for them. We had Longboat Vikings, we had Nova, Gazlo, Chogal, uh, Alex Straza and Stitches, uh, Backdoor Strategies, like everything but yeah, Twin Blades variant. Nobody cares. Now, game number one, the best of three series here. Rega de Haka and Nubarak. Now, this is Warhead Junction. And one of the things that is definitely still true when we're talking about maps like this is the boss here kind of reigns supreme. If you are able to, able to get the boss and maybe push with it, you are usually in a very, very good spot. So... Warheads are great, getting the occasional nuke off against your opponent is definitely going to give you something, but at the end of the day, uh, if you are just marching with that boss through the top lane, you can already do a lot just there by yourself. Now, Tracer is the last one that gets banned out, Benny on Muradin, and we get Hogger. I kind of feel in that context that Benny is going for a maker. That they're gonna go down that path. Normally, Benny is somebody that I value for his avatar picks in a in a time when Haymaker gets picked way too often, in my personal opinion. But I think this is this, this feels a little bit like a Haymaker game. I will see. Time will tell. Now, next two picks. Are they still going for a bounty? That's of course the next question. And it seems like it. Dino with Illidan and Yaz and Uther, and I believe that the Exodia stack has so far not completed the Illidan hunt bounty. I don't see another reason for them to pick Illidan here, but this would be it. So if they haven't completed Illidan hunt yet, that would definitely explain that. Now, is Team Ash also going for a bounty? Or do they just say like, nah, we, we just want to win? Well, ah, <laughs> 
Asmodan, baby! Okay, we get another Asmodan attempt. This could actually really work well to stack Asmodan at the beginning with the Haka and with Ophia, also with Rega, I suppose, and the Lightning Shield. You could really help Asmodan to stack very quickly. But it's not the bounty that I thought would be attempted here. We have Asmodan already played once in uh, the qualifiers. The final pick for map number one in the best of three series, ladies and gentlemen. The Exodia stack up against Team Ash with Sergeant Hammer picked last. Let's go! Game number one. Asmodan, baby! For the red team, for Team Ash, we actually get our boy. But over on the left side, it is the blue team. It is the Exodia stack. And well, they're playing this right now with Sergeant Hammer played by Hazu. Benny on Merlin. Yazu plays Uther. We're getting Copenhagen on Hogga. And Dainu is playing Illidan in game number one of the best of the three. Now, over on the right side of the map in blue, we're getting uh, the Russian-Ukrainian team with Renella on Rega. Colossal Totem level one. Lopaka on Ophia. Bishops on Anubarak and, well, with Greed on level 1, Asmodan played by Dawn for Life and Dead Inside on Dehaka. Now, as already explained a few times, and as we also thankfully have seen the last time that Asmodan was played on this level, if you're playing Asmodan, what, we're what you're really looking for is assisting Asmodan in the early game with his stacking, exactly the way that we're seeing here. So they are damaging the minions a little bit, Asmodan gets his globe through, and then they are just burning everything down. They can rotate with the big boy a little bit, as we are seeing happening as we speak. And the whole idea here being, uh, well, is that in time? Yep, they didn't get everything, but they got most. You want to help Asmodan to stack in the early stages. Have a rotation going, do exactly that, and then it will be much, much easier for him to get stacks together as the game continues and to also take minions down by himself, get more stacks by himself and yeah, just control the map a little bit more. So it really pays off to do that and a lot of lower level players when they're doing that, or when they are playing Asmodan, just completely neglect that and it is so absolutely crucial if you want to get value out of playing him. Now, in this case, they have him all alone at this point, which I'm not really that big of a fan of right now. I mean, he can still do a lot, of course, by himself, but Ophia dies over here, so my man is missed a bit because this is a 5 versus 4. Asmodan is sitting at 30 stacks now. You can still do it alone, by the way. If you're all alone on the lane as Asmodan, what you're essentially doing is you're auto-attacking the backline minions. So you're just auto-attacking the backline minions, the frontline minions will be attacked by your own minion wave. And then once that both of them, uh, all of them are rather low, then you drop your orb and uh, you get all of the stacks. So that's how you do it when you're all alone, when nobody helps you. There's nothing that tilts me more when I see an Asmodan player that is alone on lane attacking frontline minions the entire time and then throwing an orb on Annihilation to get a single minion stack or two. It just absolutely kills me. Whenever I like, cast lower leaks and see that, I just want to scream. But if you have a good Asmodan player, it can make all the difference. Now, don't get me wrong. The hero is still pretty meh in competitive play, but it's fun. And that's what we have the bounties for. Now, one kill to zero. Asmodan is already at 50 stacks. And we're two and a half minutes in. That's good. 50 stacks, two and a half minutes in. He's working it. They go for... Oh, the sergeant! And that's a kill. Bye-bye, Hazops. Hazops gets destroyed. The old man is gone. And at the top, now that we're seeing the first few nukes spawn, we have Illidan go up against the Haka for now. Warhead Junction is a map, as I keep saying, which is oftentimes decided by the boss, so we're going to see who has the biggest impact there. But now at the bottom of the map, another attempt. Yeah, doesn't get too much out of this. Sophia wasn't close, nor was anybody else. But it allows them already, with the damage that Asmodan does now, to get a bit more pressure against that wall. So, top side, they get Illidan, Tainu is gone. Team Ash currently in a slight lead. Now, first nukes have already been pushed out at the bottom of the map. Benny tries to get another one here, but it's just a tad too late to get that without anybody interrupting on him. 70 stacks now for Asmodan, it's not too bad. Again, he's slowly getting there. He's slowly getting to halfway decent numbers that will allow him to uh, do work 
later on, especially controlling the map and taking minion raids out. The Haka comes in. Nice. Good move to keep Benny alive here as the Haka is trying to connect the Tong. And Ubrak is mega low. They got the nuke though. Yeah, Red Team gets the nuke and is actually trying to get another Tong too. Siege Shackle has already been used. That inside gets the connect. And can they follow up? Hazu is dead again. All right, Hazu is gone. So is Uther. They get a double kill, but in the middle, they're losing a fort. Yeah, yeah. Not sure if that was really worth it at the end of the day. I mean, they haven't lost it yet, I guess. <laughs> but that is... That's a given that this is going to fall, no matter how they are doing it. Somebody is going to commit Sudoku in order to take that down. I really hope so, because even if you die in the process, it's going to be totally worth it. So, yeah. That said... Asmodan now at 90 stacks. Again, looking better and better to also do this by himself now. And the rest of the team is not necessarily needed for this anymore. But yeah, gets the hits here. Renella has to actually pause. Uh, they had some problems already earlier. And oof, it seems like Ophir has disconnected. All right, that's definitely a good reason to pause the game. All right, Ophir is back and we're good to go. So they're still looking for some opportunities to fight here. Also, Benny, and he gets lasered a little bit, and now they can push down at the bottom for the wall a little bit more. Again, Asmodan with a place here, sitting at 106, having access to mass of destruction also really helps, by the way, as you could already see. So this is another tool in the shed that you can use to make those moves. Oh, talking about making moves, Yasu! Uh, he didn't make any moves anymore, he gets caught and killed, that's five kills to one. And that is actually quite the opening for Team Ash. Exodia stack, keep in mind, qualifier number four. They lost the first series that they played against none other than uh, the Enjoyers. And right now, we actually have them falling behind against another team. Yeah, those are uh, decent plays from their opponents, with Illidan now dying, I believe, for the second time, if I'm not mistaken. Might even be the third time. Let's actually have a look. Uh, yeah, Illidan died twice. So, Dino going down. That's the end of Hazu. Hazops dying three times here. The top fort is gone. And as I said again, the top lane is important. That's where the boss moves through. So, this is a big one. Uther dies again. And damn, they're just getting farmed over here. They're really starting to struggle. I mean, woof. They're just getting absolutely murdered. I mean, level 10 abilities aren't there. The dynamic is going to change once that we have heroics. But at least right now, this is a problem. Topside forward, as predicted, is now gone. Asmodan is just getting siege damage in. It's sitting at 51,000. It has 128 stacks now. So it's getting slowly closer to completing at least his level 1 quest. But... Yeah. Another dive! Another stun! A follow-up! And Benny is trying to jump out here. Benny on the move, tries to get away, pops Avatar, didn't go Haymaker, thank you. And he gets a Divine Shield as well, which eventually is going to save him here. Minions are gone, they're actually going for the 4-2. It's a bit of a weird one. Illidan with a hunt! The bounty attempt, and Muradin still falls. I find it amazing that they're still fighting underneath the fort. They really don't care. They go for Copenhagen here, the fight against Illidan. Dino gets a bit assisted. They're still low, but the fort is already gone. And now they're turning it on Illidan again. And Illidan is just gone. The blind man gets dropped. So Ophia is just getting... Yeah, she's murdering him. <laughs> Ten kills to one. They just got two kills in this. They got two kills out of that. And a fort. And they fought underneath the fort. What's happening here? The Exodia stack is absolutely getting rickrolled right now. They come in, they think like, bait it! Now you're fighting underneath the fort. And then Team Ash comes in and is like, yeah, well, how about we're fighting underneath the fort and we're just going to kill all of them? How about that? Would that be a good idea? And yeah, apparently it was. One and a half level lead. And now they go for the boss up at the top. They got a talent advantage. They're looking great here. They got Asmodan slowing coming in. The Haka is moving at the bottom of the map and has all the vision in the world that he needs. And with them going for the boss, no rotation in the world is going to be there in time to prevent that from happening. And this should be a keep. They can take that fort at the bottom of the map as much as they want, but I would be absolutely shocked if the red team would not get a keep with the first boss. 
considering that they've already taken the fort out. Asmodan is already pushing the lane out here very easily, so it's not even like you're running into minions early on that would stop you or slow you down. So this is going to be an easy keep here. Asmodan is already working this. Red team has taken down the fort at the bottom of the map as they should. I mean, even nukes are now coming into play. So getting more and more value on all of this. And yeah, boss is not even here yet. They might go for more. You can go for the core early on. They're dropping this so quickly, they might actually have a chance here to go for the core. If they can get kills, then hell yeah. Some damage is in the cards. Taking the entire thing down, definitely a possibility. Illidan is pushing at the bottom of the map, but off we go. Boss is going for it. Illidan is back. Renella gets the Ancestral just in time. Clutch moment. Shield is gone. The core is losing hit points and the boss is still at 50% of its HP. They are winning it. They're taking it. Game number one. Easy peasy. Team Ash in the lead in the grand final against the Exodia stack. GG. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Well, we had a bit of a speed run in game number one, a uh, sub 10 minute game. And now we're heading into Inferno Shrines with Team Ash claiming the lead in the best of three series here in the grand final. So the Exodia stack kind of got a bit outmaneuvered in the first game. Now, Team Ash with an Asmodan bounty completed. What's the play? Another bounty attempt? Are they just going to try and win it? If they go for bounty, what's it going to be? And also, what is the Exodia stack now prioritizing? Should be an interesting match. Again, there is still that caveat, you know, that we have a best of three instead of a best of five because it's the weekday tournament. But also, as a quick reminder for everybody, uh, this the ten heroes that were played on the first map cannot be played again. So we have that as a draft restriction throughout the tournament. Also, reminder, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, please give the video a thumbs up. Again, it helps. Also helps to spread the Heroes of the Storm love a little bit. If we see a lot of traction and interactions are happening with the video, being it thumbs up, being it comments, um, people subscribing, YouTube is much more likely to recommend that video also to others that have maybe in the past shown an interest to Heroes of the Storm and we might get a couple of players back, who knows. So, yeah, would be nice if you guys could do that. Pretty easy, not supposed to be anything, so... But, well, as we are getting ready for our second game, we get Infernal Shrines and, yeah, my F is banned. So is Hanzo. I'm fairly interested specifically in what we're getting from the Exodia stack because they have shown that they are highly interested in just playing bounty after bounty after bounty after bounty. But they're also one of the teams that has by now completed the most bounties. So the bounties that are remaining to them are starting to become a bit more difficult. And on top of that, they're also finding themselves in a spot where they have to make a decision, right? Do you go for the tournament victory? Because they haven't participated in one of the tournaments. There were a bit of miscommunication. They were late. They said like, hey, one of our players is most likely not going to be here. So they weren't part of the bracket and didn't participate in the tournament. And then in the other tournament, they got eliminated in the first round. Yes, they won the first one. And I think it's more or less a given that they're going to be part of the playoffs. But it's still a question of where exactly do you land in the standings? Because the higher up you are, the better your position in the playoffs themselves. And that plays a big role. So you don't want to be, you know, sixth place and then start the playoffs in the loser's bracket, for example. Now, we got Malfurion and Tracer. So they're actually starting off strong. They're starting off with a very strong combo. And this might be one of the maps where they are foregoing a bounty completely and just say, boys, let's go for the win here. Game number three, maybe we're toying with the idea again. And on the other side, we got Team Ash with Johanna, Carrigan, and Brightwing. C C City! Yep, that's a lot of stuns already. Jojo, Carrigan as a follow up, and then Brightwing. Oh, not bad. Now, what are they gonna get for damage? I mean, we're gonna get a mage for sure. Ooh, talking about mages, one bounty that I believe both. I think both of these teams have now completed. Kelthas Convection. This might be one of the map. This is a map where you can play Kelthas. For sure. And again, while I would say you can also do that on Tomb, where it has been completed once, 
this is another map where Kalthas might do well for either one of the teams. With the CC that he adds, Team Ash could extend the CC chain further. So Convection Kalthas is actually an option. And quick reminder, Convection Kalthas, you don't have to complete Convection. You just have to pick the talent and win the game. Doesn't matter if you ever complete it or not. So that's something that's quite important to note as well. I don't know, get Kalthas and get, I don't know, get that. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> oh my god. The prophet has spoken. The prophet. All hail cock. The church of Kaldor is going strong again. We're going hard. So, Leo and Kelsas. So, they're likely going to go for convection. And now how does Team Ash react? Bounty or no bounty? Well... Gaslo! Alright, we're going for a bounty. Oh, they're digging deep on this one. Gul'dan! I mean, look at this. Gaslo could maybe even fall out with a gravel bomb here. But yes, we get a bounty attempt on both sides. I would be shocked to see Mana Addict for our Kalthas. It would be kind of funny if they now all of a sudden said, yeah, you know what, we're just going try hard. But given past performance, I believe this is going to be a convection Kalthas. Benny with the final pick. They still need the frontliner. They still don't have a tank. And as we're heading into game number two, we get as the final choice stitches. Ladies and gentlemen, game number two, Infernal Shrines, Team Ash against the Exodia stack. Prepare yourselves for battle. Oh yeah, baby. We're going to prepare ourselves. Believe you me. Let the battle reign. I mean, right now, let's see what the teams are pulling off. On the left. Hazorps with Kalthas, and there it is, Convection as the level 1 choice. We got Dino on Tracer, Copenhagen on Leoric, Yazu on Malfurion, Bad Benny is playing Stitches, Lopaka over on the right side is rocking Johanna, we got Renella on Brightwing, Bishops on Kerrigan, Down for Life on Gul'dan, and we're getting dead inside on Gazlo. The Lord is in the house. The Gaz Lord, ladies and gentlemen. So it is Gaz Low time. And it is convection time. Now, first of all, the question, of course, not necessary, but is he going to complete it? That's already going to be an interesting one. Is he able to complete convection here? Is he going to be able to pull it off? Yes, no. And then on top of that, of course, uh, what's happening with Gaz Low? Convection has been completed once. So we actually had Convection completed in the past. Careful. Low, low, low. Can we get a kill here? Can we get the first blood? The dudes have completed Kalthas Convection as a bounty. But the Gazlo bounty has not been completed at all by nobody. Now Gazlo is already on the way up towards the top. We got Drain Life build for Gul'dan. As Leoric went into fealty onto death. And yeah, Kalthas has the first stack. One stack so far. Ah, it would be funny if they're just trying to target Kalthas in those fights and take him out. And obviously, are uh, going up against Carrigan, Brightwing, and Jojo. So that's a huge CC chain that they're running. And if Kalthas at any point is a bit out of position, he is going to die. Even if he completes it, I mean, it doesn't give him any survivability. So Kalthas is living a very dangerous life here. Mana Addict gives you a lot of survivability. Kalthas gets target already. He has a single stack. I mean, not even worth it. He dies first, so he goes down. Hazu, the old man, he gets killed again. But, and loses the one stack that he had. So they're just trying to warm up, I guess. But the point still is... It's not like, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not like they had any kind of, yeah, I, I don't know, like 10 stacks or 15 or so. So, great, you removed one, but they're also going to try and remove a little bit more. As is. Anyways, so, with level 4 talent, the drain build continues with health funnel. We have the hyper focus coils for Gazlo. Kelthas continues things pretty traditional with Netherwind. And they are... Uh, are they even invading the camp? Nah, they're not. But I think for a second they were at least thinking about it. So, either way. First shrine is up. You know, the party is going to start. When it comes to the mage battle, I mean, Gul'dan is definitely going to reign supreme here. Nice heal for Bidewing, but it might not be enough. Bishops with a stun combo. They're trying to turn the fight. 
Nice, and they nearly did it. Bishops, he survives, but honestly, they nearly turned the tables on them. Benny with stitches needs a couple of good hooks throughout the game so that they can uh, do their work here. Yeah, it would be pretty big for them if they could pull that off and, you know, just get those hooks connected, get the root as a follow-up, maybe a gravity lapse and then some isolation kills because essentially that's what they're aiming for here. Can they get them? Yes, no, no, we'll see. For now, they are aiming for Trace at the bottom of the map, but Dainu is able to get out. It's actually kind of interesting because I thought they would be more committed to the Shrine fight. Now teams are, of course, as usual, trying to go for level um, for level 7. But in that context, at least, I thought they would be a bit faster there. They're now trailing 26 to 15 points on uh, the objective. And uh, they want to go for the kill. Go Ben Hagen. Leoki goes down. So Leoki is eliminated. He's gone. And they might get more. They're trying to follow it up on Bad Benny. Hazu now. Oh, the heal from Brightwing. Not clutch at all, my friend. Stacks are coming together for Keltas. He's sitting at four. A little bit more. And Gul'dan finally dies. Another hook on Brightwing. Get back over here. So, trying to go for a bit of an imper impersonation move, but yep, they get the first Arcane Punisher. The Exodia stack off to a decent start, as they're now pushing through the middle. They may there may be a kill behind, but now they're looking a bit better on uh, on the kills, uh, sorry, on the um, on uh, the stacks for, uh, for Kelthas. Again, the survivability is not going to increase if he completes the quest, but at least he's going to lock in some significant damage boost for himself. And that's going to help as the game continues. Always assuming that he also follows that build, but as you can see with the level 7 talent choice, we're now having burned flesh, so yes, we are getting indeed more of a focus into a flame strike build from him as this continues, and as we of course should, so that's going to make potentially a difference. Decent defense here in the middle. I mean, again, 50% of the hit points are gone. He didn't lose the, the fort at least, so that's great, but it's still solid damage. I mean, I think both teams are going to be pretty okay with this as it stands now. So, yeah. Either way, Benny again with the hooks. This is going to be the big one. This is going to be the one that can potentially make a massive difference in this game. And yeah, maybe even win it. One good hook, sometimes all that you need, especially in the later stage of the game. Gorge, of course, will be followed up. It's not like they're running anything along the lines of Medi, but Kerrigan, always a threat. Showcasing that already against Dainu. But Bishops is always on the line with this, and he might still die. He's not out of this yet. No Parker, though, at the front. And jumping back out, the two side laners are missing. Yasu! <laughs> and it's a double kill. Stitches just killed Malfurion. Then again, to be fair, it also led to the kill on Gul'dan. But that was a funny one. He doesn't go Gorge, by the way. Putrid Bile for him. <laughs> yeah, but if you're Malfurion in that situation, you are going to be massively annoyed. You are definitely going to be annoyed on this. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, Malfurion is pissed. Oh, can we get on here? Yeah, All right, so they go for bishops again. They really have a hard on for Kerrigan, don't they? Kanslow is at least for the time alone at the top lane. Okay, so he pushed the lane out a little bit and it results in another tower getting destroyed. And he went for Mecha Lord here. Or Robo Goblin now. I assume that we're still going to get Mecha Lord at level um, 20. Always assuming the game goes to 20. But, yeah, three kills to two, level 10 versus, uh, sorry, level 11 versus level 11. Fairly even game up to this point. So, I'm, uh-oh, again, this time, all right, Brightwing is still there to the rescue and to help out. But yeah, fairly even game right now, and honestly, a pretty decent one. I'm very curious who completes the bounty. Both of them are pretty cool. Nine stacks by now for Kelthas. Ah, careful, Gaslo! <laughs> Taking all the Phoenix damage there. Lopaka also a bit low, gets another shield through though. Yeah, nice. 
That was important. Shield for him. Dino. Another hook. And it nearly leads. It leads to another. In the same situation. The exact same situation. Just that this time they're also getting a kill on Brightwing. Maybe even Johanna. But this is... <laughs> this is starting to get funny. Maze to the face. Full on switch up play by Leoric. As they're getting the kill here. But yeah, take a look at this. It's just kind of funny. I mean, come on. This is the second time this happens. The hook comes in, Gul'dan is at the front, and he's just like, ooh, freebie. And he goes to take Tracer down just to die himself a moment later. That Stitches is currently their worst enemy, more or less. Now, the blue team is starting to look a little bit better. They're also looking better on the objective. Not only do they get the kill against Gaslow at the top, they also have essentially the objective now taken. So that's also pretty nice for them. They're getting another punish on this, and it leads to Team Ash slowly falling a bit behind here. Yeah, Team Ash is starting to have a bit of a problem. Because now, well, can they get a kill at least here at the top against Benny? That would be a nice start. And instead, they might actually lose some heroes. Houses of 12 stacks now. So it's not only that, I mean, there's a frozen Punisher at the bottom of the map that gets pushed. Over here they don't get a kill, the fight turns against them. Now Lopaka is about to fall. Yeah, I mean, it gets more dangerous by the second for them. So they're really finding themselves in an awkward spot. This is still salvageable, of course, but it's a totally different game from what we've seen in game number one. Horrify helps Gul'dan for a moment, but he's still gonna die. So he's gone. They're not even getting a counter kill against the Orki here. Gaslow is dead again. That doesn't help the cause either. So things are looking worse and worse for them. It's now the blue team that is really gaining momentum. Bishops at the top is at least able to get them some value as he drops the fort low. But it's not like they're going to easily claim this one. And bot side, yes, Tracer has to back off too. But it doesn't really change the fact that they are now leading on multiple aspects of the game at this point. They've taken two objectives in a row. They have more, well, they have roughly a one and a half level lead. And things are just looking better and better for for them. If they maintain that momentum here, then uh, yeah, that's all that they got to do in order to potentially tie the series up and force game number three. The hook extension that level 13 brought for Stitches obviously helps a lot as well. So they've been capitalizing on that throughout all of it. And now we have Gaslow and uh, uh, Kerrigan still split. Obviously they're level behind. So the goal for now is just get experience, get level 16 and get the extra talent. But currently they're not there yet. There's a fort that gets uh, maybe even destroyed at the top. Kerrigan has a chance. She's going to try and do that. But the rest of the team is suffering across the map. I mean, uh, yeah, right there. It's the middle that gets attacked now. That's so where uh, the next thing plays out. But yeah, Kerrigan is getting this one. I mean, good for her. Kerrigan gets at least the fort at the top. They lost two. They at least damaged one. So that's nice. Mm, but they need a bit more than just four. It's nice in the sense that they're not falling too heavily behind. So this is still something that once they have level 16 talents, they can potentially bring back. But of course, they're still down one fort, they're down five kills, they're down a level. So yeah, there's a lot of ground to cover if you really want to bring the game back. And one of the things that you would have to do for sure is to, for example, now move in, get a nice team fight going where, I don't know, you get a blessed shield out, Kerrigan gets a, gets a multiple stuns, uh, that would be one. And yeah, if they can do a few of these things, then it's still something they can pull off. Maybe in the late game, with potential Mecha Lord would also be an option. But right now it's another shrine that pops up and that's where you really have to face the music and see that you can do some damage finally. So on top of that, we're now having them even invade. So they're, they're trying to play aggressive. I mean, it's Team Ash after all. They know what's going on. They know that they have to play aggressive in order to get anywhere here. So the camp is taken. But can they win the fight? That's the question. 38,000 damage by Gul'dan and he's trying to chip in a bit more. Escaping the Entomb was important, but Gaslow's in trouble. Benny wants him. The heals from Brightwing are not enough and that's a kill. Carrick and oh, they're coming through and they get him. 
So, Stitches is gone, but Carrigan pays with her life for the kill. There's a nice push now at the top, but Gul'dan falls, net just losing too much. It's a 1 for 3 trade, and the Exodia stack is just looking golden here. So, yeah, Exodia stack is looking great. Kelsas with 15 stacks, he's now the one to make the play up here in order to try and ensure that they're going to get rid of the camp. They're getting for they're going for another objective as well. So this is gonna be another one that they're locking in. This is three in a row by the way. At the bottom of the map the keep has already been exposed, which is another problem for them. And yeah. Every single aspect of the game is currently working in favor of the blue team. I wouldn't mind a third game. I'm going to be blunt here. Game number three? Hell yeah, count me in. But this is another fort that falls at the top. 13 minutes in, you're not going to stop that Punisher. It's just not going to happen. So, yep, this one is going to take it. It's going to take down the, the fort here. Gaslow is at the bottom of the map. Again, trying to limit the damage a little bit and uh, specifically trying to make sure that the gap in experience is not going to be too massive. But the fort is gone, Brightwing's gone too. I mean, they're losing one more ground. Look at, look at Kethas. Kethas goes down! He goes down and loses his stacks. <laughs> nice! <laughs> at least they're able to get a kill on him. But Carrigan falls, despite everything that they just accomplished here. I still don't see him bring this back, at least not all that quickly. So, yes, as it stands, the ball is about to go down. They're diving in deep. Gaslow, he's now back for defense. But, yeah, it's tough times here because the keep is now getting attacked. The Punisher is still at 28%. He might not get the keep completely, but, yeah. Now, to be fair, at the bottom of the map, all this pushing that, uh, that Gaslow has done has now also resulted in the bottom four taking significant damage and being down at 50% of its HP. But, well, since there's still minions of, uh, alive, at uh, the top, this keep is going to fall. It's going to be the first one. The level 20 advantage is obviously big. Kalthas gets a range extension, which is going to be helpful, but since he has to start at zero again, it's still going to be a bit tricky. Nice kill against uh, Leoric. That's honestly mostly important because it means that they're catching uh, up in experience just a tiny little bit faster. So they will hit level level 20 with this. And yeah, All right, well, soon. And since they haven't even lost it, this is, this is just a meme when you see that. Really? I mean, Leoric is maybe even committing Sudoku for that. I don't know. I certainly would be tempted, I can tell you that much. But yeah, we'll see. Leoric is already on his way to the top. I would be shocked if he does. So the keep is going to fall. Now, level 20 is in. No Mega Lord, by the way. He went into the Bomb Toss here. Mostly C, but we now have also Haunt for, uh, uh, for Gul'dan. So, yep. Yeah, that's another tool in uh, the arsenal. Over here, again. Follow up from Kalthas. Alright, so far, so good. Can they get some kills? Gaslow is getting really crushed through a lot of this. He did five deaths on Gul'dan. And this time it's Jojo that dies nearly immediately. So, yeah, just this is one of the last chances that they have in order to bring the game back and they're losing that tank right away. Then again, can they get... Oh, they got so close to taking Malfurion out here. They got so close. But now that they failed to get the kill, Bishops dies. They're down to three heroes again. Yeah, I mean, if they get Malfurion, maybe, you know, without the healer. Once that you lose your sustain, maybe there's a chance, but it's just not looking like they're going to be able to do anything on this. So, yeah, it's tough. One keep is already gone. Uh, right now, are they even going straight for the core, or how are they playing this? Seems like they're trying to play this as safe as they possibly can and make a move for a few more keeps first. They're attacking the middle. They're attacking the bottom of the map. They're essentially all over the place in the attempt to ensure that they're winning game number two and force game number three. Now, so far, they're good. Exodia stack, and they're crushing this game. They're absolutely crushing game number two. Art of domination. Maybe not a speed run as we've seen from Team Ash in game number one, but this is one way street Heroes of the Storm right now. They are dominating what's happening. They're making the big plays. They double the kills of the opponent. 
I just hope that they know that they don't have to complete the quest. Because if they have to complete the quest, they're gonna extend the game for <laughs> potentially a long time here. It's eight stacks that he still needs, so I hope that they're fully aware that it's totally okay to just pick the talent and that they don't have to move through now with like, oh yeah, we are going to complete it. Because that's gonna take a long time. And that might allow the red team to get back into the game. So for their own sake, I hope they're, they're aware of it. And I guess they are. But here's the fight, next Punisher, final Punisher potentially. This is the one where the team in uh, red has a final chance. They have lost all their keeps, but here's now an opportunity. A small, small opportunity to maybe bring this back. Arcane Punisher has already been claimed. Catapults are slowly pushing for the core. And they're about to lose Gaslo. He explodes and yes, that will be game. I mean, they're losing more. Nice chrysalis here by bishops, but I think they're losing too many heroes now. Brightwing, for example, doesn't stand a chance. And just look at the minimap. Catapults, minion waves are now all pushing in. Everything is making a move for the red team score. And we're going to game number three. We're going to definitely go to a decider right now. They're chasing the rest. They're going for the five-man team wipe. Jojo's trying to escape with an iron skin cooldown that just came back in time. But Lopaga isn't able to do that either. So yes, that's game. The bounty for Kelthas completed by the Exodia stack. They are able to get the Convection bounty completed even though they didn't complete the talent. Once again, has on 15 stacks. But we are going now to game number three in the series. GG. And we're heading into the final map of the best of three grand finals. So the Exodia stack brought it back. Dominant performance on the last map. Well played, well done. Again, not an insane speed run like we've seen from Team Ash on the map uh, before, but still, they dominated the game. They did really well there, and there was very little that uh, Team Ash could do. So right now we have our third map coming up, 20 heroes are unavailable because they've already been played in uh, previous games in this series and uh, whoever wins it here of course is gonna win qualifier number 5 leaving us with only qualifier number 6. Now as a side note, the Kalthas bounty was also completed and I know I'm repeating myself here but I still want to make this very clear, the bounty itself or the, the quest itself was not completed. But just picking the bounty, uh, sorry, picking the talent and winning with it is already completing the bounty. That's all that you gotta do for it. So Lucio gets banned. And with Garden of Terror being a pretty big map, uh, I'm kinda curious what kind of picks we're now getting. Falstad and a couple of other heroes for potential shenanigans are still up. There's of course also the questions, are we still gonna get bounties? If so, what kind of bounties are the teams now going to try and go for? So, yeah. Again, we'll see. Blaze play banned, Hanzo banned, and after Lucio to prevent heroes from just zipping around of Garden of Terror. Next choice is coming in in a second, I guess. The interesting part would also be if, for example, Greyman gets now picked here. Greyman would also be a really nice one. I think Sylvanas hasn't been played yet either, right? Was she playing game number one? <sighs> I, I can't even remember, but I, I don't think so. So I think Sylvanas is still up. I mean, either way, we'll see. Uh, what they're now going for. But I wonder if we're gonna get more bounties. So far the idea for a lot of the teams have been like, hey, you get a bounty, we're trying for a bounty as well. Obviously it's not only about you getting bounties, even if you just shut down bounty attempts of your opponent, it's good for you, because it means that uh, they have less tickets, they get less of a share. Hazops is already answering our question if Sylvanas was played or not, and the answer is no. We get Sylvanas locked in right away as first pick. Not really a big shock, it's a great pick for the map. And now the double pick on the other side. Genji and E. Ah, ETC. Lopaka played in a previous series in the semifinals. He played ETC and it was an absolute delight. I loved it. With uh, Crowdsurfer as a level 4 talent choice, he just ran circles around the opponent. I think it was. Was it Crankle Crew? But yeah, it was just glorious. I absolutely loved it. And I would love if he would be able to... I mean, it's not necessarily about winning, but perform on the same level. And there's our bounty attempt. So they go for Cho'Gal. They want the Cho'Gal bounty here. 
against the ETC play from Lopaka. And that of course immediately begs the question, are we going to get a bounty as well from Team Ash? They have a lot more bounties available to them, so they could dig a little bit deeper in that pool and maybe find something that they can use in this situation. But we get Sylvanas plus Chogal, which is in and of itself already a bit dangerous because you can push on two sides. Chogal also has this nasty thing where if you get him to level 20, he gets of course his cooldown reduction on the death timer. Limits it by half and this is a very big map and in a big map like this that's very very dangerous. Because it empowers you to go for your opponent's side of the map, take a keep down, sacrifice yourself and then you're alive again by the time your opponent crosses the map to try and punish you for it. So yeah, it's, it can be really dangerous. Some teams have been using that to cheese with Jogal after level 20. So if it comes to a long game, that is a serious threat and something that they need to concern themselves with. Greymane, I mentioned him before, would have been great for the map, but he gets also immediately banned out simply because he's great against Jogal. The reaction is Turanda and Tychus though, so we have now two tools that they can use against Chogal as well. Hunter's Mark is of course going to help with single targets very nicely. And then in addition to that you have Tychus. So Genji, Tychus to try and drop him. Turanda to increase the damage a little bit and also follow up on the stun. I mean ETC and Turanda is an old school combo that has been played a lot uh, back in the day. So something they can use here. Final two picks. Morales! Morales and Deathwing! Alrighty! So, Chogal, Deathwing, Morales, and Sylvanas is what we're getting. Deathwing for some global moves on the map as well. And yeah, that's actually pretty cool. I like that. Whereas Dead Inside is making the final pick. Uh, okay, they need... Oh, ho, 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 they go for the murky bounty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Garden of Terror, Murky against Chogal, everybody. <laughs> this couldn't get any better. The final map in the grand final, everybody. Let's go, Team Ash against the Exodia stack. Game number three, and boy, oh boy, we are in for a treat. It's gonna get silly here. Yasu and Morales for the Exodia stack. We have Hazops on Gal, then. Copenhagen is playing Cho for the team with the Callous Tide. Dino and Sylvanas and Bad Benny on the Deathwing. Over on the right side of the map. This is where things are now getting very, very interesting. Renella on Taranda. Down for life on Tychus. We're getting Bishops on Genji. Dead inside with Guitar Hero on ETC. And Lopaka with a fish eye on Murky. So it's Murky time. Murky against Chogal. They counter here. And I'm kind of looking forward to this. This could be fun. Octograb against Chogal with only Morales as a support on the side of the blue team. You know what? Octograb, Hunter's Mark. There are quite a few things that they could technically try to do with all of this. So, yeah, maybe after level 10 that works. 20 brings the danger that I explained during the draft, of course. But this is gonna get interesting, very much so. And again, if that doesn't justify a like on the video, if you're watching on YouTube, then I don't know what does. So hit that like button, hit that sub button, and help spread the love a little bit for the series, because this is gonna be fun. Chogal Murky and look at that egg position as well. Somebody's getting it a bit aggressive with that. <laughs> yeah, Murky against Deathwing. <laughs> that alone! I know Morales dies at the bottom of the map, but honestly, I couldn't kill us right now. This is amazing. Murky against Deathwing. They're trying for QQ Ops and can't get the kill because he's still able to dash away from that. Oh, Sylvanas also nearly caught here. Yeah, Team Ash! Heavily aggressive. First of all, able to get the kill against Morales at the bottom of the map, who's now back to business. But then they're also trying to steal the camp away at the top with success. Murky doesn't really care too much. And Genji, choo choo! Uh, back on the train as he's going for Dainu and trying to poke him out a little bit. But, yeah. There's Benny checking the egg out, so he knows what's happening. Terror. 
is very slowly burning it down. Shouldn't really be a big problem for Murgi, but Lopaka, of course, has to be super careful right now. It's actually kind of, it, the one thing that is a little bit sad for me personally is that Lopaka, I've been really praising him on his ETC performance in the semifinal, and he's now not playing ETC because he's the one that plays Murky for the team. I would have loved to see him on Murky once again. Uh, sorry, on ETC once again. It was so much fun to see that series. So it's a little bit of a shame that this isn't happening. It would have been cool. But I'll take the murky performance every day, I suppose. Yeah. So, yeah, it would be kind of funny. Now, again, mega aggressive egg positioning. I'm actually quite amazed. I did not think that he would go that aggressive on it. Also, Tychus goes for full on auto attack build uh, in case he misses it. No, the bigger they are or anything like it. But, yep, they're really pressuring Shogal right now with this ETC power slide into Hunter's Mark, into Turanda stun, and then uh, damage from Tychus. Tychus has gone into press the advantage on level 1 for the range increase. And then on top of that, we're now having also in the rhythm. They need to work on that synergy a little bit as you could just see. ETC following up and pushing the target out of the follow-up stun is a little bit suboptimal. But, yeah. They lose to Ronda. They're just overdoing it a bit with the aggression. I mean, it's Team Ash after all, right? So <laughs> what do I expect? I'm not complaining. But the one thing that I still need to highlight is that they need to yeah, coordinate this slightly better. I like the aggression. I like the willingness to fight. But if they want to take Chogal down, then they can't mess up the stun comps at least. So right now we get the cellular reactor for Morales. We're having with level 7 the vanadium plating. Shogal going into the Enraged gener Regeneration. Yeah, and with the ball lost and both teams now on level 7. Getting ETC with Hammer on. 38 stacks now for Tigers. And he's gonna get a lot. Ooh, and he goes into the Combat Tactician as well. So, alright, cooldown reduction. That means, I mean, this is honestly a build where I wouldn't even be shocked if he goes into Drill. I really hate Drill. I think Drill was very uh, nice in the day. Odin is way better. But if all that you're trying to do is like really demolish Cho'Gal, then Odin isn't really doing anything for you at some point. So yeah, if that is the prime target and will be the prime target, he's just, he's just trying to extend the stacks and the duration and then punish him throughout all the team fights. That might be something that he's at least considering right now. Odin is still amazing, you don't have to use it. Drill gives very little value. So you can keep Odin to just try and siege up from a distance, for example. But this is one of the games where I would not completely be flabbergasted if I see it. Drill. I'm not saying take it. But if you are going in the rhythm, I mean, that's back in the day build, right? In the rhythm and then follow up on that. Do you think he's gonna take it? Nah, not really. But it would also not just, yeah, floor me. Now all the way up at the top, still. <laughs> Death wing against Merc. <laughs> oh yeah. So, 63 stacks now. 66, I mean, he's getting shit tons of stacks. Thanks to the cooldown reduction too, the amount of miniguns that he can throw out with this is pretty spectacular. So, the range increase is fantastic. Morales is already low, but I guess that's the end. Oh, ooh, no, Tychus actually gets out. Alright. 87 stacks. Nice, we're 6 minutes in. 87 stacks is a lot. Yeah. This is really working for them right now. He has 22,000 damage. Now, can they get those kills later? That's the question. So, level 10 abilities. Oh, Morales goes for Medivac, Octograp, yep, and there's Drill. As I said, doesn't really shock me. I could have totally lived with Odin, but yeah, that's definitely Octograp against Sylvanas, and Sylvanas is down. Genji and Murky get the kill at the top. Nicely done. Down here on the other hand, the camp at least goes to the Exodia stack. Can you get a few more hits? Nah, they have to deal with Siege Shines first. So they want to get the Seed. It's a very big map. And Murky is going to play a role here too as this continues. Murky is already working the top line. Hit him with the fish! Hit him with the fish! Oh yeah! Hail to the king, baby! There's only one Murky. So, leading experience currently goes to Team Ash. It's not a massive one, 
but yeah. 99 stacks for, <laughs> for a Tychus. And Murky has Octograb ready again. Okay, the Owl comes top. Murky is getting ready. Genji is coming. Yeah, can't Octo... Oh, Octograb's already! The disc is out. They might get the kill. He doesn't have the cooldown. Doesn't have the cooldown. Wailing Arrow gets used, so they're trading cooldowns, but he wants he wants the kill. He wants the kill. He gets the kill. Bishops is able to get out. Dice. Lopaka shutting down the cooldown on the wave. That was the key there. That's the second time that Sylvanas gets now taken apart. And Tychus is just continuing the stacks. Again, he has an additional three seconds already on the minigun. And this is after eight minutes. And he is continuing this throughout the game. I mean, look at this. The extra seconds are already helping him here. He's at 112. And the key to proper in the rhythm stacks is usually that you just need to stack it early on as much as you can so that you have that add-on effect that comes through eventually. Yeah, Taranda, careful. Tychus, more stacks for him. 125 again. He's looking good here. That's additional four seconds, basically, that he currently has. Not quite, but very close. I'm a little bit worried for the Exodia stack. I'm not quite sure how much uh, Shogun is going to do for them here as this continues. Octograb is a problem. Dance, baby, dance! And that's the end of Shogal. Sylvanas is also gone. So is Morales. Big, big blow against the blue team now. That was big. They're letting him dance, they're going for Choga, then they follow up with Morales, so they kill four heroes in total, and all that they lost in the process was Murky. They have one seed, they can go for structures here. Granted, this is not really the fastest process in the world that we're seeing from them right now, but boy, they're doing all right. That fort at the bottom of the map is getting uh, slowly murdered. Molten Block, obviously, is big. So that's a huge talent right now for survivability, and Choga scales well into the late game here. ETC has to move back, but the fort is still gone. And immediately again, they're trying to go for Jogal here. 150 stacks now for Tychus. Down for life, trying to get out. Uh oh, Deathwing is helping out too! ETC is still in the drill. Ah, but they're losing Taranda again. And here comes the superhero landing from Deathwing. Genji is also there. That's the end of. Oh, no, Tychus! Dashes away and he gets out! He gets away. Good for him. They abandoned Murky at the top, by the way, and that Benny goes down on Deathwing. Benny on Deathwing is gone. Went a little bit too deep. Tiger survived, which is wild. And Murky has the entire top lane to himself now. 43,000 damage for Tigers, 43,000 for Gal. So Tigers and Gal are currently playing a battle for top damage. Cho is very close though. 39,000 for Cho. By the way, two seats to zero. Two seats to zero for Team Ash. If the blue team has to be worried about something, it is really that late game that I pointed out earlier. That's the one thing that they need to cons be concerned about a little bit. Because now they're gaining momentum. They have the map control, they have a leading experience, they have uh, garden terrors that will allow them to take more forts out. But the problem could be, could be, a level 20 on Shogun. Shogun scales well into late game scenarios and that level 20 talent allows you to commit Sudoku and really just trade your life for structures. So that is a bit of a problem. Benny alone at the top. Port is down. Port at the bottom has already fallen previously obviously. So now with level 16 talents they're getting also the sizzling attacks. That's another one. That's huge. And immediately Shogun dies again. Shogun dies. Murky sacrifices his life for Sylvanas. The Exodia stack is losing ground quickly. And boy, this is quite something. This is quite the show that Team Ash is is showing us here. I mean, holy hell. 180 stacks on Tychus. He's sitting at 5 extra seconds right now. 5 extra seconds on the minigun. He has an insane minigun duration. So, they're going for the bottom keep already. And they are, they are just dominant here. Deathwing like, doesn't like this either, by the way. So, Tigers has two superb targets on the other side. And it really shows. Shogal might outdamage him in the end. Gal particularly, of course. But he is he's doubling what anybody else can bring on the, on the team. I mean, to be fair, 
next tie up. Well, well not quite doubling 31,000 for, for Genji, not that bad. But look at the minimap. They haven't lost a fort yet. They've destroyed all the forts on the other team. And it's not only about this combo and about Tychus and his insane stacks, but you have Murky. Murky is just a pain right now. Gets an Octograb out once again. Slap, slap, slap. Is die is dead. And this time completely down. The egg got destroyed before. But he did so much. And they slowed him down. So yes, Morales is flying in now. But does that matter? Not really. ETC should be able to get away here. And they just took the keep down. So they can't really chase them. I mean, they're trying to chase them. But I don't think they can. Not with ETC. Just pushing them back all the time. And that just results in an easy keep that gets destroyed. We're only 13 minutes in, and Team Ash is looking awesome. Exodia Stack is doing what they can to bring this one home. And they have level 16 talents now. That gives us the Leaden Orb. We're getting the friendly fists over here. Extended care, so a bit better for Morales now. But they're losing the macro game, and a big part of that is, of course, Murky. Maybe not the most sexy situations. Octograbs are always nice and oftentimes lead to kills. But here comes the blue team slowly attempting to bring this back a little bit with a few kills of their own. So, dead inside. Okay. Mosh pit. I mean, yeah, they're not running into that. He's actually getting away. Gets out. X strike and Sylvanas dies. X strike on Sylvanas. She's down. There's another slide right on the medivac. EDC might die for this, but they're getting Chogal. Chogal Morales! Oh my god! And of course, it's also going to be the end of Deathwing. Deathwing is dead as well. Entire team gets wiped. Five man team wipe. Are they going core? Can they go core? 14 minutes in? Are the death timers enough? Well, they have level 20. Why wouldn't they? So yeah, they're going to try and end the game here. We got the entire team ready. We got drill, baby. We got the drill. Tychus. Oh yeah. So it's five seconds for Sylvanas. It's not happening. 213 stacks for Tychus. 64,000 damage. It's game. Team Ash wins the tournament. They win qualifier number five and complete the murky bounty. All hail Merkley, Mer <laughs> Merky, Merky, <laughs> GG.